Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum. This is being filmed on Wednesday, October the 29th in the Memorial Arena in Victoria, BC. I'd like to thank our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes it all happen. This has been a momentous week in Canada and that's what we're going to talk about. I, I just want to start off by reading something I wrote down a little bit of. This is what I think is the most important thing. We need an independent investigation of what happened last week in Canada. My concern is that I don't think we can trust the politicians. I don't think we can trust the media. We certainly can't trust the RCMP or CSIS to tell us the truth about what happened in Canada this past week. And yet, between the politicians, the media, the RCMP and CSIS, they are creating the story that we're being told. I don't know what the truth is, but these people have lied to us basically my entire life. And I'm not willing to believe what they're telling us without asking questions. You know, the country has been mourning the death of two people, two soldiers who were killed here. And we have to follow that up by doing the right thing. And that is an independent investigation of what happened. Our guest in this segment is Mehdi Najari. And Mehdi, uh, we're going to just talk about this issue. Are you asking me what I think? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I totally agree with you because uh, this incident last week is totally in different league. Until now, we had uh, Toronto 18, or we had the danger of bombing of the, the train, or we have uh, the bombing uh, of uh, legislature here last year with the Canada Day bombers, so-called bombers. But nothing, nobody was killed. No blood was shed. But yet, like, last week, there were four people are dead. Two of them innocent soldiers, two of them supposedly they are the perpetrator of the crime. Uh, but so I don't know what really happened last week. But if, if I'm going to make a, some guess, I go to the past. What has happened in the past on this issue, this issue of the radicalization of the so-called Muslim youth or the convert? And I go right back to United States. There was a study done in 2000, uh, 2013 by uh, Trevor Arerson of uh, Mother Jones magazine. He has written a book called The Terror Factory. And he, he has shown that the 99% of all the so-called terror scenarios and act that FBI stopped was created by FBI and its informant without FBI support and providing a scenario and getting these uh, poor, mostly poor uh, people with mental illness, addicted uh, young man to manipulate them and make them to do something that they would never do if FBI would not manipulate them. So we have uh, Trevor Arerson wrote a book, The Terror Factory, and it is available, people can, can read. But there are uh, many, many other articles that have been written about this. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, for example, one headline, the FBI again toward its own terror plot. So the FBI again towards toward its own its terror, own terror plots. plot. And that's Glenn Greenwald, yes, in, who is one in of the most Salon prominent. Magazine. Yeah. And uh, another one but in Guardian, fake terror plot paid informants, the tactics of FBI entrapment question in Guardian of uh, Manchester Guardian. And uh, Joshua Holland wrote uh, another article called only 1% of terrorists caught by FBI are real. Terrorists. And uh, I'm just going to read the first sentence of this. So this is a story by a very famous, world famous journalist now, Glenn Greenwald. Um, written in Salon magazine? Yes. Yeah, so e the first sentence, the FBI has received substantial criticism over the past decade, much of it valid, but nobody can deny its record of excellence in thwarting its own terrorist plots. Time and again, 
the FBI concocts a terrorist attack, infiltrates Muslim communities in order to find recruits, persuades them to perpetrate the attacks, supplies them with the money, weapons, and know-how they need to carry it out, only to heroically jump in at the last moment, arrest the would-be perpetrators who the, M who the FBI converted, and save a grateful nation from the plot manufactured by the FBI. This is Glenn Greenwald, for God's sake, and we never hear a word about it anywhere in our media. This is what I mean when I say we can't trust the media to tell us the truth. And here is another one, terror plot hatched by FBI by David Shipler of New York Times. So the establishment paper in the United States talk about this. But my problem was when these things happen in Canada, how come nobody bring this issue up that it, we cannot trust what the authorities are telling us because look, look what's happened in the United States. And right now, in, with, in Canada, FBI is working with RCMP and CSIS in a co close co collaboration. We know in Canada, uh, in, in Toronto 18 case, first of all, they were not 18 people that plot anything. They were at together 18 people and to make it as a big event, uh, seven of them were, were dismissed because there was no evidence against them to did anything. From that 11, there were four teenagers under age. And one thing that people don't know, there were two agents, two paid informant and agent that hatched the whole, the whole uh, incident. You know, they pushed this impressionable young man with no experience in life to do things, to blow up things, with, and so on and so forth. One of the informants got about $3 million, the other one $4 million for their handiwork. Uh, people don't know these things. And also, last year we had the incident of uh, Canada Day bomber. Yes. The, the F, uh, this, the was the, this was the supposed attempted placing of a bomb at, at the BC legislature building. Yes, and, and at the disappeared from the news when things began to look strange. To unravel the, the story that RCMP and authorities gave us at the beginning, they said it was an Al-Qaeda inspired, self-radicalized, these two, p this couple were self-radicalized and inspired by Al-Qaeda ideology, but not in contact with international terrorist cell. This is what they told us. But then by July 4th and 5th, when the media start digging a little bit and, and ask question uh, about uh, John Natal and Amanda Crody uh, from their friends, one friend, uh, his name was Daryl uh, Nelson. He said, my friend John is about 39 years old, but his my mentality is a mentality of a 16 year old. And he was on methadone at the time, was, was an addict on methadone. He was trying to get rid of his addiction. And he said, uh, and RCMP start putting them under surveillance according to RCMP statement from February, January, February of 2013. And Daryl Nelson said that exactly at the same time, a group of uh, Muslim brothers came to his life that tried to, to get him, to isolate him from his friends and give them a job in a furniture store and pay them to take packages, uh, you know, g give them good money to deliver packages. And he said, I asked John Natal, do you know what is in these packages? He said, no. I said, don't you think maybe there is something illegal, maybe drugs, you know, they are, you are being, uh, becoming a drug mule? And he said, oh no, my, my uh, Muslim brothers will not do that. So who were these Muslim brothers, Mr. RCMP? You told us nobody affected them. They were self-radicalized. Who were these Muslim brothers? Because at the time you were doing your surveillance of him. These, these are very, very troubling questions. Here we have a young woman, Amanda Crody, that is wanted to fit in. She wanted, at the one friend said that she wanted to be a, a model fashion model, and then, uh, then a, a star. Then she, wa he, she, then she decided to be a Muslim, you know, con Conway. She 
desperately, and the friend said she desperately wanted to be fit in to something. So I think, I mean, what you're saying is there's clearly evidence from both the United States and Canada that something is going on with, with a lot of these so-called plots. W what concerns me is coming out of this, we're seeing new laws brought into Canada very quickly. I, and do, I'm not sure, I don't know anything about them, but I know they're, they're going through the Parliament right now, major new laws that are going to allow the police and the corporations who run them to surveil us more than ever before and arrest us uh, in advance of anything we might uh, be interested in doing. Show me that thing you showed me before, I if you've got it, where there's this group that has, it's a, like a terrorist watch list and they have an E team for uh, environmentalists. W w what's happened is, uh, uh, what's happened is that th there was a grandmother a 71-year-old uh, grandmother, Leslie Askin, she wanted to participate in, in, uh, in the Kinder Morgan hearing with National Energy Board. She went and took a picture of the, the storage facility of Kinder Morgan in, in Burnaby. And the day later, two RCMP uh, uh, officers came to her, to her door and questioning her because they were, uh, she was uh, being suspect of being a, a terrorist. And the two RCMP officers were from ENSET, the Environmental Division of the Integrated National Security Enforcement Team. It's, it's getting really uh, scary. If our, if our citizens want to participate in their own democratic uh, practices and they are being uh, questioned, <laughs> Yeah, so just, uh, I'm just going to read the headline here. Um, this is from CBC? No, that's from uh, Vancouver Observer. Okay. Leslie Askin, 71, shocked to be deemed a Kinder Morgan terror threat. I mean, can you imagine any of us phoning the RCMP and, and ever asking them to do anything? But Kinder Morgan phones them up and, uh, and two agents are down. I, I really think that as Mr. Harper tells us, and the media, because Mr. Harper works for the same people who own the media. That's the way the country works. So what they are telling us is that we face a terror threat and we need much stronger laws to enable them to protect us. But really, I think what's going to be happening is that we are going to be the terrorists. You know, that's what they're going to label us for even wanting to act in any way democratically. And, uh, and those laws will then apply to us. See, for the present government, uh, everybody is, 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 a, is a criminal until proven not. You know, for example, all these people are committed a crime right away. We, you know, the judgment is by the government. The fact is, Michael Zihaf Bebio and Damian Clearman, the, the young man that went to Syria and died there, and John Natal of the Canada Day bombing, all of them had mental illness. All of them has mental illness. So why are we not providing young men and young women with mental illness some, some care? You know, M Michael Zihaf PBO was so desperate. In 2011, he begged the authority to put him in jail so he can get rid of his addiction and, and make his life meaningful. And we betrayed them. The mosque betrayed this man. By, by pushing him out, kicking him out, instead of finding a way to help the man to kick out his addiction and his problems. Uh, that, that is a really big issue. In terms of, in terms of the young man, the so-called jihadists that went to Syria, and all these events that is happening, RCMP and CSIS have been observing and monitoring these matters for seven, eight, nine years. How come they haven't come with any recommendation to our society how to prevent this radicalization? The Damien, Damien Clearmont mother, Chris uh, Boudreau, she is trying to create a, a program of de-radicalization. Why the government they haven't done anything? 
they are monitoring. They know how if there is this self-radicalization in the internet, they are monitoring this. Do, don't you have the, uh, the responsibility to tell us how they are being radicalized and how to prevent your, our young man and woman uh, to fall into the same trap? Yeah. Now, supposedly, it was, I mean, what I've heard in the media, it was the call from ISIS to uh, worldwide that, that uh, Canada uh, should be attacked. That was kind of the beginning, you know, yeah. the beginning of the last story. But it's widely reported around the world that ISIS is created by, funded by, and run by the, the people who run the United States and their allies. ISIS was good guys until last year when they were in Syria decapitating the civilians and soldiers, cutting their head off. Nobody talked about ISIS at then. ISIS has been created by Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Qatar, and United Arab Emirates. And they were, how they about the United States? And, and with, with the supervision of CIA. And they were the funders, even the Joe Biden, the Vice President of the United States few weeks ago, said as much in, in a talk to a university crowd, said that uh, there are allies funded ISIS and tried to uh, make United States as a, as a bystander. You remember when ISIS went to Iraq, they had all these shiny Toyota pickup truck. They all came from Turkey, you know? So now they suddenly they are using ISIS as a reason and excuse for intervention, especially in Syria. The issue is a regime change in Syria since they couldn't do it with their, with, with their uh, fanatics that they, they uh, paid for and uh, uh, supplied them arms. Now they are using those fanatics as a reason to intervene in Syria and change the regime of Bashar al-Assad. So ISIS supposedly radicalized these two young men. ISIS is funded by, run by the United States. What does that mean? And our media won't tell us. Very powerful new laws are being passed in Canada right now. They're going through Parliament right now. There's nothing in the media about them. We don't know anything about them. Um, a lot of people, if you go onto the internet, a lot of people are saying, you know, was this a false flag operation? People are wondering. We've got to have an independent investigation. I don't know who the independent authority could be, but, but we can't simply believe what we're being told. You know, the government pretends right now, and the media pretends they care so much about these two soldiers who were killed. People care, but I don't think the owners of the media care, and I know they don't care, because 10 years ago, when 5,000 Canadians were killed by the drug Vioxx, right, a major drug killed 5,000 Canadians, there was nothing in the media about attack or let's change something or what can we do to make this better. There was no honoring of those 5,000 people because they were killed by, the, by a, you know, it, it's a different story. It's how they how they frame issues, and we've got to be very careful. The fact that media never talk about this, uh, this sets up with the FBI set up there in, in, in the United States, the fact that uh, media doesn't talk about the Toronto 18 and, and the fact that there were two agents that manipulating these young men, the fact that uh, uh, there were Muslim brothers that working apparently for the security agencies here, and, and getting these two impressionable, naive, uh, drug addicted, mentally ill uh, couple to, to do things that they never wanted to do or, or be capable of doing. The fact that they are not talking about all these things is sure that the media is not doing their job. So is the job of independent media like this program and others. You know, we see for example in Tai, Four days after the July 1st bombing announcement, Bob McCann of Tai talked to Trevor Ireson, of, um, uh, of uh, uh, author of the, uh, the Terror Factory, and, and he said, it's eerily similar to all the schemes that, uh, that FBI used in the United States. What's happened with uh, John Natal and Amanda Not Crowley. one word anywhere in the media about that. But it was in Tai. Yeah. So. Uh, go to globalresearch.ca. They're carrying a lot of stories about this from a different perspective. Mehdi, thank you very much. You're welcome. And thanks for watching this segment of the Citizens Forum. <laughs>
Welcome to segment two of Citizens Forum being filmed on Wednesday, October the 29th. Um, thanks again to our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff. In this segment, we're going to be talking about living the new economy. We'll have two guests, and the first is Nicole Mohn. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Jack. And um, I guess question number one, what is the new economy? Well, that's a big question. Uh, it can't really be distilled down into any one thing. It's really an umbrella term that we've used to sort of uh, a basket, if you will, to hold a whole number of things that are emerging in terms of how we're doing economy in new ways. So um, just to list some of them, maybe sharing economy, gift economy, indigenomics, which is a term coined by Carol Ann Hilton um, about applying you know, sort of ancient practices and principles in indigenous worlds into a modern world. Uh, permonomics, which is a blend of permaculture practices and principles in an economic context. Um, crowdfunding, shared space, uh, the sharing economy in general, um, like is that. This, uh, is, you're doing a project right here <coughs> with an event early in November. Yes. But th th is this a worldwide movement? It, it is a worldwide movement. Um, I th I th there's, there's sort of a grassroots movement that is coming to more and more prominence all, all over the world. And I think in some places it's been happening longer than it's been happening here. Um, so yeah, and, and this year, um, while the event is based in Victoria, um, we're live streaming, and Jason will talk more about the live streaming later on. So it's Living the New Economy Global Live. So literally anyone, anywhere in the world can watch it and the reason one of the reasons we wanted to do that is so that we can produce one program and lift boats in all parts of the world by by them getting the education that they get through through uh, watching or attending coming and seeing the event well one thing that is 100 percent absolutely true is that we need a new economy because <laughs> this economy <laughs> is not only a disaster but it's turning into a nightmare yeah i hope the new economy will be better i guess we can only can, can we I think we human beings can do better, and yeah. Well, well, I think so too, and and um, that's exactly what caused me to create this project. Um, I, I literally woke up May nineteenth in twenty twelve at three o'clock in the morning, and I just had this hit that I, I've been I've been doing large event production for a wh while, ten years or something oh. like that, and and. I just knew the next event that I had to do had to be on money. And I did, that's, a, that's about all I knew at that point. And um, I had, the, it came out of a lot of different things, but one of them was um, a book called Sacred Economics, written by Charles Eisenstein, who's now also written a book called The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. He's going to be one of our speakers. Um, but I, Ian McKenzie had done a 12-minute short video called Sacred Economics, and I'd, I'd seen it um, not too long before that, and I'm like, okay, this guy gets it. This guy understands how we can merge from the old economy into a new economy, and it doesn't mean ditching everything that's old either, but it's, it's bringing the, the, the bits that are serving us and bringing the bits that are serving the planet and, and, and humanity. Um, Along with, we, we're still probably going to need Canadian cash, you know, to, to do stuff. It's, it's not ditching the old in, in favor of a new and doing a complete flip, but it's integrating it into stuff that, that serves the planet and the people on it, all living things, better. Well, I have a lot of respect for anybody who is a large event promoter because I <laughs> wouldn't even want to imagine all the things that, I mean, would drive me crazy. It's a little crazy. I've never done events bigger than this. The first two were seven days long. This one's five. We've 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 toned it down a bit to five days. <laughs> um, who are the events? Who are the speakers? And what's the event about? Um, the theme for this event is about integration, like I was talking about earlier, um, which means um, two. Th I'll get to the speakers in a sec, but the. Integration means two things. It's like taking all the different aspects of the new economy and talking about, um, particularly on day two, financing the future, how those things weave together to make some kind of cohesive whole that lifts up a new economy for us. So, but also how are we as individuals and businesses and so on, how are we integrating various 
um, new economy practices and principles in our own work. For example, there's community currencies is something that's starting to come up more and more. A system called open money that, um, that it, it's a currency that is only viable locally. So it, again, it's one of these things that it lifts all boats. When you, you, spend the, you have to spend the currency for it to have value. You can't hoard it. And so it's a different way of viewing how we do money, for example. Um, um, so in terms of speakers, I mentioned Charles Eisenstein. He's attending digitally, which is possible in the way that we're delivering this event. Um, um, let me think. Uh, Carol Ann Hilton, who coined the term indigenomics, she's coming and doing a workshop. Um, now, I don't know what indigenomics <laughs> is, but it sounds very interesting. It Carol sounds like taking some ancient practices and yeah. bringing them into the modern world. That's exactly it. Um, Carol Ann is New um, uh, by descent, and um, she is an, uh, d has a, a company called Transformation, and she goes into First Nations and other communities and helps them transform their economic worlds into ones that are sustainable for the communities. Um, I know she's worked in um, First Nations communities with things like 90% unemployment and helping them undo that and, and um, move into worlds that work. Is the planet going to survive the new economy? I'm not sure it's going to survive the old economy, but, but if we can switch into a new economy, will it give us a sustainable future where the planet counts? That's part of the point. Yeah, absolutely. It's fundamental to, to the new economy conversations. Is um, Some people call it a regenerative economy, and regenerative is a permaculture word, which means um, um, every action that you take generates something that contributes um, to, to the planet or to, to humanity. So there's no disintegration that happens. Nicole, in we've processes. only got two minutes left and okay. two questions to go. Okay. But this sounds great, <laughs> the new economy. Um, what do you want people to take away from it? Well, there are lots of things. And one of the things that I, I, I want to mention in terms of speakers is we just got David Corton um, as one of our speakers. Um, he, he's, um, he's coming, he's streaming in for, ha uh, for half an hour. And he's the co-founder and board chair of Yes Magazine and the author of Agenda for a New Economy. Um, so I'm excited about that. I want people to understand that they have some power here. That if, in, in connecting with people in the, their communities, that they can change how they are living on the planet and in their communities and within their own households and their own lives and businesses in ways that support the planet. Yeah, sounds good. Um, really, we need change. Last question, what can <laughs> the community do to support this vision? Can, can attend. <laughs> attend. Attend. We want people in the room. There's still some seats. Um, can I ask if, how much are tickets? Um, yes. Uh, for five days, it's $300. For one day, it is Okay, 80, I think. Okay. Yeah. Any free speed talks or anything like uh, that? The that first day, day one, Opportunity Fair is by donation. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's, it's a really interesting, almost a trade fair, but it's more about what opportunities people are offering in the new economy realm. Okay. Living the new economy. New global live. Living the new economy, global, global live. Global live. Sounds great. Yeah. Nicole, thank you very much. Thank you very much for doing this. Thanks, yeah. Jack. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Our next guest from Living the New Economy is Jason Giel. And Jason, we'll start off. Um, how and why did you get involved in Living the New Economy? Mm. Mm. Um, I discovered this event last year. Living the New Economy has happened for a number of years in Victoria and Vancouver and in the UK. And I was invited to this event and I saw this array of conversations happening all within this new economy umbrella, which looked amazing. Permaculture and indigenomics and gift economy and sharing economy and ethical entrepreneurship. And it was just um, a bunch of conversations that I'm really interested in. And so I volunteered and um, helped with some communications and marketing. And fell in love, the thing was just amazing and totally blew my mind. And so um, our founder, Nicole Moen, uh, I approached her after the event and I said, I want to be involved more deeply. And so this year I'm co-producing the event with her. 
great. Um, well, I'm already looking forward to it then, even though, you know. Um, but I understand that you have changed the model this year and you're streaming it. Yeah. The change is a hybrid of a bunch of things kind of happening symbiotically. One is um, historically the event, we've called it a summit. So it's been sort of a large uh, convergence level event um, hosting hundreds of people potentially. And this year, um, Nicole and I wanted to shrink the physical model and make it a bit more lean and simple and um, also to broaden the scale simultaneously. So by introducing live streaming, we're able to make it available to the world and anyone with internet can join us from afar. Um, I recently launched a project called the Stream of Consciousness Project and it's a live stream project for conscious creators. And so we're leveraging the equipment that we have with Stream of Consciousness to broadcast uh, Living the New Economy. And people are doing satellite events out there. There's living room showings and larger public showings. And so it's definitely achieved what we want in terms of being able to grow and foster and amplify these new economy conversations. Um, where is it going to be? We're hosting the physical live event here in Victoria, BC at Sunset Labs, which is a downtown micro venue uh, where the stream of consciousness system is now based. Where, whereabouts is it downtown? Uh, Sunset Labs is near Canoe Club in Valley Village at the bottom of Herald Street. Okay. And yeah, it's a small 2,000 square foot space that uh, hosts this broadcast equipment and will enable us to have 100 people live in the room and then infinite number of people tuning in online. Um, there's something called Five in Five. Mm. Five in Five is a distinction that I coined um, just a number of weeks ago. Basically, uh, I've noticed that at a lot of events, you go to something really amazing and the speaker or the content creator doesn't really give you an access point to participate. They don't tell you how you can help or how you can get involved or what actions you can take consistent with this amazing thing they just expressed that has you motivated. I've noticed that with, uh, with David Suzuki even, like these people that are really passionate about their thing. But so how I, do you get in? Yeah. How do you join them? What now? do I do now? So, uh, so five and five is really simple. It's five actions that you can take the viewer in less than five minutes. And so we're introducing this five and five process and we're asking every speaker and content creator to come up with their personal five and five. And so we invite the audience, we say, here is Elizabeth May's five and five. Here's the five actions that I say that you could take for Elizabeth's mission, you know, in less than five minutes. Is and Elizabeth gonna be at this event? She's not yet. Okay. I'm fishing. Okay, okay. But, but that's the point is So what would be, people, for example, a yeah. five and five? What, what are five yeah. things we can do in five minutes that would have any impact whatsoever besides watch TV. Right. Not that there's anything wrong with it's watching so TV. It's so great because you've just nailed it. Like the story is that we can't make an impact in five minutes. And so most of us, we have ADD these days and we, we have a hard time really like taking a lot of action and maintaining that or understanding that, you know, we have a diluting motivation. You know, you see something that's amazing. In the couple minutes after that, you're inspired for maybe a day, three days, but then life, life's again. And the likelihood of you going back and you know, signing a petition or subscribing to their newsletter, it diminishes. So what can so we do? Five, so five, five actions and five, well, so for a five and five for living the new economy, as an example, off the top of my head, okay. would be, um, you know, go to our website and bookmark it. Uh, subscribe to our newsletter to follow new economy conversations. Um, note one speaker that's speaking at living the new economy and bookmark their webpage for future exploration. You know, follow us on Twitter and make a comment on a post on our website or Facebook page. It seems like micro actions, but I believe that that level of engagement can be a starting point and an access point to deeper engagements. You subscribe for our newsletter, it takes 30 seconds, but if you engage it and if it has value to you, you're now part of the new economy conversation. And that's important because now you'll be getting some information. Uh, well, I don't know what you'll be getting. Who knows what the newsletter has in it? But it opens the door. Yeah opens that door, yeah. It also gets speakers really responsible to create really clear intentions for what they want people to do. Yes. I, I think that a lot of people that present ideas, they aren't clear about that. They haven't really thought through what I want the community to do now. And so this forces that crystallization. Yeah. You know, years ago I was uh, doing a radio show with a friend of mine and we used to have guests on talking about different things and my friend was into solutions and he would say, well, what can we do? And, and literally they would be dumbfounded. They wouldn't know what to say.
because they know all the information about a topic and, and to criticize it or, you know, an, an important criticism. But what can we do? It's like there's, there was nothing. But, yeah, this is I share your friend's yeah. concern. Yeah. Um, what else do we need to know about this event? Mm. Living the New Economy is a series of really important conversations. And what we need to know is that you have the access to participate live in Victoria or live online uh, via our live stream. Our website is www.livingthenewaconomy.com. So if we go there, we'll be able to get a live stream off of that? Yeah. www.livingthenewaconomy.com. Yep. Okay. You can buy live tickets for the event or purchase the live stream online. Okay. Um, Do you have to buy it? Yep. Oh. Okay. So uh, it's certainly less expensive than the live event, which is one of the things that we're doing to try to allow participation. Is there like 15 minutes of free streaming that people can see how good it's going to be and then they'll want to buy a ticket? No, but the vast majority of our speakers are very well known okay. out there in the new economy conversation. And so you can find lots of their work in YouTube or other articles they've written or things that they've published. Can you mention a few? Yeah. Um, Mark Silver from Heart of Business in Portland is joining us. Um, Mark is a master teacher in his Sufi lineage and, and a brilliant um, heart-centered entrepreneurship teacher. Tad Hargrave has a company called Marketing for Hippies in Edmonton, um, another brilliant wizard who teaches us how to maintain our core values while still building a business and building a community. Um, Charles Eisenstein, author of Sacred Economics, is joining us. He's going to be Skyping in, so that's one of the advantages of this digital context is he's in New York and we're going to be streaming him in both to the event live and then propagating that out into the live stream for the world to participate in. Um, Donna Morden, Caroline Hilton, um, Ian McKenzie. Yeah. So yeah. these aren't names I'm familiar with, so clearly there's a whole world out there that I know nothing about. Totally. I had the same and experience And it's the world of the new economy. Yes. Well, we need a new economy. There's no question about that. Agreed. We need a new economy. Yeah. Welcome to it. Yeah, well, uh, it's good to be here. It's coming. <laughs> Uh, Jason Giel, thank you very much. My and pleasure. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Good evening, I'm uh, John Farkason, and uh, you're watching the very first edition of a new program called the CRD in Context. Uh, the purpose of the show is to examine how our uh, local decision makers uh, uh, think and how their critics think and why they think the way they do. Of course, you'll hear a lot about uh, what they think in terms of their pos positions and perspectives on the different issues within the Capital Regional District. But our primary focus is going to be on examining the underlying beliefs and values that they think from. And my first guest is Ross Crockford, and he's been kind enough to uh, be a guinea pig for this uh, first, first uh, crack at the format. So Ross, thanks so much for volunteering You're welcome. today. I really appreciate it. And uh, for our viewing audience, uh, would you give us a bit of an overview on your history as a, a critic of some of our um, elected officials? Uh, well, I was the editor of uh, Monday Magazine for a while, and I've been uh, writing freelance journalism a lot about sort of Victoria affairs and Victoria history. Um, then I was uh, got involved heavily in the uh, Johnson Street Bridge project as a sort of watchdog uh, with this group of other people, and and we. Um, organized a, a petition to uh, force a referendum on that project and, and ever since we've been monitoring its, uh, its challenges. Okay, well, um, let's start then with that issue since you're quite familiar with it. We'll start with the, uh, the new Johnson Street Bridge that's being uh, constructed. So in a, in a couple of sentences, uh, could you just give us your current position on it? Well, I mean, the bridge is is being built. Uh, nothing can be done really to stop that. Uh, my my particular concern now is that a bridge is being built that we really don't know anything about its uh, durability and how long it's going to last uh, and serve the city. Uh, we've just received sort of assurances from the engineers that they've said, "Oh, this is all fairly standard," but when you take a look at some of the documentation behind what they're building, it's not standard at all. 
Okay, so in terms of uh, you know, looking at uh, particular bits of documentation, how do you decide which documentation you're going to look at and give uh, credence to as opposed to, let's say, other documentation that the, 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 the bridge engineers may be looking at? Well, um, a lot of this, the, the credit for the, the information that has come to light that I've been looking at has been uh, thanks to f uh, freedom of information requests conducted by Focus magazine. And uh, people who read Focus magazine uh, have probably read a lot of uh, extensive stories there by Dave Broadland. But the one thing uh, or that I've been doing is sort of corresponding directly with David and getting a copy of the, of the materials on which he's been basing his stories. And some of these things are, are uh, kind of surprising. For example, um, the bridges right now is being built by a company called PCL that won the bid, but there were two other companies that were unsuccessful. And we never really heard anything about what those companies proposed or what they said. We just know that uh, their bids were higher in terms of a dollar amount and that they were uh, proposing something that, that the uh, sort of very small group of city engineers uh, didn't approve of. So, but those reports were never released. The city never said why those were rejected, why PCL, they just said that PCL was, in their opinion, the best bid and that's what we should pursue. So, Focus Magazine actually FOI'd the, the proposals by the other companies and the shocking thing was that they proposed radically different designs and they said the reason why we are proposing radically different designs is because the one that you have put before us uh, is, uh, although you can probably build it, uh, it is extremely uh, novel, uh, unconventional for movable bridges and probably is going to introduce all sorts of elements of uncertainty uh, into the, the, the manufacturing process, the, the installation and the long-term maintenance. And now we're starting to see these things happen. Okay, so, so in terms of the evidence then, what, what you seem to be paying particular attention to is, is the information, the documentation, fair enough, being you know, uh, um, acquired through uh, freedom of information uh, re um, uh, applications. Uh, but it seems to be the, in the information that's coming from the people who didn't win. Uh, do you think that that information, w wouldn't that make that information suspect a bit in terms of, of uh, they lost and the other guys won? Well, that they were willing to, it, it, those companies, uh, I mean, they're all staffed by professional engineers. Okay. Those companies presumably had an interest in, in winning the contract mm -hmm. as much as anybody else did. Um, and that they would take the risk of proposing something radically different. I mean, if you propose something radically different to, to any, uh, anyone uh, that you're trying to bid on a job, to say, I'm sorry, but your idea, your original idea is bad, um, there's a risk you're not going to get the contract. But obviously these companies felt that that was a risk worth taking, that they had to sort of make a statement that there, was, there are problems here. Okay. And um, so I, I, that's why I, I find it interesting. Now, I've also l we've also looked at the, the documents that PCL itself has produced and the engineering companies that are now developing the, the mechanism of the bridge that's under construction. And those are also worrying. There are all sorts of, uh, as Focus Magazine has pointed out, you know, there are these, uh, the, the, the connection between the big wheels and the, and the gears that fit underneath them. The, all of this is going to be affixed using thousands of gallons of epoxy grout. And uh, we, there was a strange meeting in April where the, the engineers sort of without any kind of prompting from the council did a presentation where they talked about all of this epoxy grout. So it was like in response to Focus Magazine, even without Focus Magazine ever being mentioned at any time, but it was obviously there was some worry that there were concerns out there and they kept assuring the councillors who didn't know anything about what the problems were in the first place that 
uh, this use of epoxy grout was entirely within the manufacturer's specifications. Well, it isn't. It's not that no one has ever used huge quantities of, of essentially epoxy glue to connect uh, these teeth that are going to have gigantic mechanical loads on them. Um, so yeah. hanging upside down from wheels on a movable object. It's not that they're, they should point to some examples where such things have happened, but it's not possible. Okay, so you know, you bring up the, the notion of, you know, of, of risk, and you say it's, it's worrying. Um, and, and, uh, but but it aren't you know, great engineering projects, uh, great outcomes. Um, um, certainly have to look at the risk, but sometimes it, um, uh, if you uh, stay with that particular uh, uh, concern, uh, then nothing really great will ever get built. Well, there's sure there's all all projects entail some degree of risk, okay. but but um, the the city of Victoria is is not a, not exactly uh, Washington D.C. It doesn't have or you know New York City. It doesn't have like a gigantic pool of money to draw from to be able to sort of accommodate uh, uncertainties. And this was one of the things again that was warned by these other companies. It's like you've stated very clearly you've got this affordability ceiling for the project, that you okay. have to do it within this limited amount of money. And that's the reason why we're telling you, you don't want to do what you have proposed because there is too much uncertainty. There's too great a likelihood that you are not going to meet that affordability ceiling. Okay, so if, you, if you're going to uh, risk and possibly uh, uh, risk a lot in terms of building something monumental, you better have the deep pockets uh, just in case things, yeah, things go exactly. sideways. Be prepared. Okay. Okay, Ross, let's move on to uh, one of my topics that I talk a lot about, and sewage. Again, same thing. A couple sentences. Where are you at on sewage? Uh, well, uh, uh, I, I guess I agree with the need for an evaluation of a distributed uh, system. Um, I don't know if uh, that will uh, reduce costs dramatically because it depends on what kind of, of actual processing is used um, within the distributed system itself. But there, there still are uh, even larger questions, and I guess this is one of the things that's, that's um, unclear to me about the, um, the opposition to the, the CRD's plan is uh, is, is a distributed system exactly what the goal is, or is the, is the goal to, uh, as some people have put forward, to suggest that, that actually we don't really need sewage treatment, which is, uh, I'm also inclined to believe is the case, or that sewage treatment in any form is not necessarily going to solve uh, the problems or all of the problems that uh, we have to deal with. It may solve uh, a few of the problems, but at what cost? So the issues for you then are, are certainly of cost. And, um, and uh, what about, and you mentioned the, uh, one, the, the possibility of maybe, you know, we don't really need sewage treatment because of the unique you know, uh, marine setting that we have right now with regard to, we have a secondary base system, it just happens to be located offshore right now. Well, that's, I mean, that argument, uh, I, I think, has been out there, uh, but it has, has really fallen uh, by the wayside because the focus now really is on the fact that, that we have this sort of limited period of time in mm -hmm. which the federal and provincial governments have said that uh, you can have some money to deal with this, and so the so uh, the temptation is, and it's very similar in the with the bridge project, and that is that uh, if upper levels of government say you have money, then for God's sake, do something, anything, because <laughs> you can't afford to give up that money. That, at least I, I'm I'm saying that's not what I believe. I'm saying that that seems that's, that's the attitude the yeah. of when you're sort of at the third level of government is that right. when, when there's something is dangled you, from above. You, you grab it. You have to grab at yeah. it. And so that's the, you know, what the fury is over now is what is it that is going to be built that will still grab some of that money. 
but about other considerations such as uh, making sure that we ha get the uh, the greatest you know environmental impact in terms of uh, the the way that we treat our sewage. Well, that's uh, Is, the, you know, the most uh, that's the most important thing because that's the whole reason why it's being done in the first place. So for, you, is for environmental so for you, that's impact. the most important thing: the environmental impact. Absolutely, and money comes uh, second in terms of uh, that particular project. Well, the the financial impact will be big no matter what. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yes, that's the whole reason for for. Uh, doing any of these, uh, I mean, the sewage treatment in particular, is uh, for environmental reasons. So, in terms of you know, you're, you're sort of the uh, we've talked about two infrastructure projects, the bridge and, and sewage treatment. If you had to uh, sort of um, articulate the one underlying assumptions or or, or, or or value that you bring to the table on infrastructure projects, what would it be? Hmm. <laughs> um. Well, with the bridge, you mentioned risk. You mentioned, uh, um, yeah, you mentioned risk. You mentioned, uh, you know, financial limitations. With the uh, sewage treatment, you mentioned uh, the money aspect in terms of it being on the table from the feds. We got to run for it. We have to go for it. Uh, so, what, what, you know, in terms of Ross, Crocs, Ross Crockford's uh, philosophy on on infrastructure, if you had to sum sum up your philosophy on how to address large infrastructure requirements, what would it be? Well, the, there's a, one difference, uh, I guess, between the two that we've talked about is that in the case of, of the Johnson Street Bridge, it's, it's one project among a whole bunch of things that the city of Victoria has to do. The Capital Regional District does not have any other sort of looming mega project that it has to undertake. Its sewage is sort of the one that has, okay. has announced <coughs> itself and it's not like it's, and, and it's already uh, calculated that, that that's where it's going to put all of its eggs. But what, what's becoming apparent to people in Victoria is that there are a whole bunch of other things that the city of Victoria has to do aside from uh, build this one bridge. So, so um, different context. So yeah, I'm interested in the in the uh, totality of of the circumstances. I mean, what are all of the things that are being taken into consideration here? And that's the you know I think that it has been one of the very valid criticisms that's been raised about the sewage treatment project is is that um, it's only focused on what's going to happen. You know w that we are eliminating the the. Uh, the effluent from the water, but of course, the, the, but dealing with that involves all sorts of other consequences, and nobody really seemed to think or worry that there were going to be environmental consequences to those right. until we started getting into it, and that's what started leading to the opposition. and And among those consequences are the locations of the of the sites and the transportation of the sludge, and mm -hmm. and you know what how it's going to be dealt with. Okay, well, let's stay on the uh, philosophical level here and move on to uh, mayoralty uh, debates. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a number of people running for, for mayor, in, in, for the mayor position in the different municipalities. There's one fellow who's running for uh, uh, the mayor position in all 13 municipalities. There's a clown running in, uh, in uh, Victoria. And um, when it comes to a, uh, you know, a community association or whoever, wanting to mount a mayoralty debate, um, what limits, if any, should be put on who gets invited? Um, well, each individual association that's holding the organization uh, can establish its own rules. Uh, and um, I don't understand, I, I guess I'm a bit confused by why community, some community associations are saying, well, we have to, as a matter of principle, keep these debates open to absolutely everybody under all circumstances, no matter what. And, uh, but, but even then, they're, they are uh, changing them somewhat depending on how many people are involved. There used to be uh, debates among council candidates, but now there are so many people running for council that uh, they can't do that anymore. And so a lot of them are switching over to this kind of trade show yeah. format and things like that. Um, and then, the, but the real question that you're asking about is what to do about people who are disruptive or fringe candidates or, or things like that. Well, I think disruption may go with the territory in terms of you might have a very, you know, vocal 
candidate. But it's the fringe in the sense that they have not a hope in heck of winning. They just right. they don't have a you know the proverbial snow snowball's chance in heck of winning. And yet, uh, so sh should they be invited? Um, yes, if they're if they're participating and and they haven't if they haven't disrupted previous uh, events. Um, but I just wonder if perhaps the thresholds should be set higher for the number of signatures that people have to have. Uh, I don't think you can increase the amount of money uh, that they can afford to pay. But Okay, but maybe increase the number of signatures yeah. at the front end. Okay, Ross Crockford, thank you so much for uh, vo volunteering to help me out on this uh, inaugural launch of the CRD in context. And um, please um, come back and visit us when we have a a one-hour format uh, either next month or the month after. Thanks very much and thank you to Ross. You're very welcome. I wanted to talk about that old picture. Is This is from the Dutch uh, painting uh, uh, and the, the painter was uh, Lucas van Leeden. He, he painted a picture of uh, Mohammed and Sergio, the priest Sergio. Uh, Prophet Muhammad and uh, Priest Sergio were good friends. The picture is from 1508, and they were sitting and drinking and talking with each other, having enjoying uh, each other company. And they passed out. They drank uh, drink so much they passed out. And the picture showed that uh, a group of well-heeled men uh, in the background sending a soldier, uh, and while Muhammad and Sergio are passed out. The soldier killed uh, the priest, Sergio, and take the, the sword and put it in the hands of Muhammad that is passed out. I think it's very important. There is nothing new under the sun, looks like. You know. Here again, uh, Van, uh, Van Leden is telling his society that be careful when they are trying to uh, demonize a group uh, or, or the foreigners or the unknown entity like Muhammad and commit crime and, and label them as a, as, a, as a criminal. Be careful because those crimes may, may be happening by the authorities when they send their soldiers, their, their agents to do their crime. <laughs>